Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the UCF Sociology Virtual Open House. We are very excited to have you all here this afternoon. Um, whether you're considering our Applied Sociology Master's Degree Program or our new BA to PhD program, we are really excited to share with you the strengths of our department and give you a better sense of what you can expect as a hopeful eventual student um, in our graduate program. For those um, graduate students currently in our department thinking about the new BHD, BA to PhD program, we also welcome you as well. We hope you continue um, along with us as well. Um, let me start by introducing myself. I am Dr. Tim Hawthorne. I am an associate professor of GIS in the Department of Sociology and also the graduate program director. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's session where you'll get to hear from um, staff, faculty, and also some of our graduate students about their experiences on our program and what our program can offer you as you continue on in a graduate degree program as well. Um, I should also note that we are recording this session for those participants that registered and maybe weren't able to attend at the last minute, so we will be sharing this recording out with those participants that emailed us ahead of time as well. I just wanted to make sure to remind everyone of that. Um, another um, note to mention right here as well is that the session has a few um, moments on the agenda where we'll have time for question and answers but you are certainly welcome to post your questions or comments into the chat session at any time, and we will do our best to address them either in the Q&A or um, in a written chat back as well. So please do feel free to share those questions in the chat um, as well. Um, so the first thing we'd like to do, um, for those of you that are thinking about applying, we wanted to start by having a, a short conversation about the application process and about application deadlines and a little bit more about what's expected from applicants. So to start off that part of the conversation, it is my pleasure to introduce an amazing member of our team, Bridget Burke, who is our graduate admissions coordinator and someone that many of you, if you haven't already, will be interacting with quite a bit as part of your application process as well. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Bridget. Thank you, Dr. Hawthorne. Um, as Dr. Hawthorne said, my name is Bridget Burke. I am the Graduate Admissions Coordinator for the Department of Sociology. My role in the department is primarily to assist with the application process. Um, I'm also, also heavily involved in graduate funding, as well as assisting students with course selection, degree requirements, substitutions, and registration. Um, I like to think of myself as a red tape wrangler, so I help students deal with all of the bureaucracy that comes along with um, going to school at a very large university and um, helping to guide you through you know all of those fiery hoops that you have to jump through um, your first step in becoming part of our learning community of course is the application process the application process differs a little bit between the ma and the phd programs i'm going to talk a little bit about the ma process first and then i'll address the phd process and the additional requirements for international applicants. For our two-year 30 credit hour applied sociology MA program, the application deadline is January 15th, though we normally recommend students apply by January 1st to give our graduate committee plenty of time to review all of the applications. Um, applying by that deadline um, also allows you um, time to, if you're missing any requirements or things like that, it gives you time to get those in before that January 15th deadline. In that application process, which is done through the College of Graduate Studies website, um, you will be required to submit a transcript from your, your previous higher education institution, so your bachelor's and or associate's transcripts. Um, that's done through the electronic process through your institution, your prior institution. Uh, you'll also be required to submit three letters of recommendation um, from either uh, previous professors for your academic work or your work in your professional life. Um, so we do accept, you know, both types of recommendation letters. And you'll also be required to submit a personal statement, um, which Dr. Hawthorne will cover a little bit more in the session, as well as some, um, some more tips and tricks on the recommendation letters as well. Uh, for the revised 
specialized BA to PhD program, which is our five year program with the masters along the way option. Um, that does no longer requires a master's degree and neither program require um, GRE scores. So you don't have to take a GRE exam in order to be eligible to apply for the program. The application deadline for domestic applicants um, is January 1st for the PhD program and for international applicants, it is December 1st. So you wanna make sure you have all of your materials submitted by um, either of those deadlines. In that application process, there are a few more requirements than um, we have for our master's program. For example, you still have the three letters of recommendation, you still have that personal statement, and you still have the writing sample, but you do need to also submit a CV along with that that outlines um, your professional and academic work um, that you've done in uh, higher education, if possible. So we just kind of want to see a little bit more about your background on that CV. Um, for the PhD program as well, there is an option to select on the application if you're interested in funding, which is something that we'll talk about a little bit more later as well, um, so that you go into a pool of potential applicants who might be funded as graduate te teaching assistants um, in the program. Um, and Dr. Hawthorne, again, will talk a little bit more about the personal statement and those recommendation letters as well. Um, once you submit your application, either for the MA or the PhD program, those applications are compiled um, by me and I provide those to our graduate committee for review. Um, they usually take a week or so to review those applications um, through our holistic admissions process. And then we meet toward the end of January to make both funding and admissions decisions. So if you apply by that priority deadline in January, then you should expect to hear uh, an admissions decision from me um, sometime in early February. We do accept applications for our MA program, you know, after that priority deadline. Um, but like I said, we normally recommend getting that application in early so that you are in that first round of applicants and then you have plenty of time to make your um, acceptance decision and make plans to relocate to Orlando if necessary and, you know, kind of work out all of those moving parts that's necessary whenever you're first starting out in graduate school. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Dr. Hawthorne to delve a little bit deeper into the personal statement and recommendation letter requirements. Thank you very much for that great overview, Bridget, and my friends on the call. Um, so I'd like to give you the tips and tricks for standing out as a potential applicant to our program. And I'll tell you, there's not a lot of hidden secrets to this. The biggest thing that I can say is we want to see your interest shine through, right? We want to learn more about how your interest connect to our program strengths. And so I think what I have found as the graduate director and in working with the graduate committee as we review and discuss applications is the ones that stand out the strongest are personal statements that allow us to understand um, what it is that you drew, drew you to sociology, what drew you to our department specifically, and what has kind of got you to that stage in your life, right? That doesn't necessarily mean you have had to have already done an extensive amount of um, formal research, right? It could have been life experiences, it could have been a work experience, but providing an opportunity for us to understand what it is about sociology that motivates you and specifically what about it in our department speaks to you and connects to you. So you'll hear in a few minutes from some of our faculty about the different specific thematic areas of interest in our department. We always recommend for students in their applications to really identify, you know, particular areas of strength in our department where they see a potential fit. That doesn't mean you have to stick to those once you get here and you take a lot of classes, but we would like to understand that you're applying to a place where you might thrive and you'll have some sort of interest connected to our strengths in the department as well. Um, another element of the personal statement that we get asked a lot about as the graduate committee and, 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 and from potential applicants is related to those students who might be coming um, from a degree program outside of sociology. So let's say um, crimin criminal justice, criminology, anthropology, environmental science, you name it, um, we've probably had the discipline apply to our program. And absolutely, we welcome people from different disciplines for sure. And we have lots of students that have come from different disciplines. I would say though, it's important in your personal statement if you are coming from outside of sociology to explain again, that connection of why 
what you've done to this point has led you to that moment where you want to go on to an advanced degree in sociology as well. So by no means will we penalize you for not being a sociologist, but we want to be able to understand what, what you think that connection and that next step might be um, in becoming a sociology graduate student as well if you're coming from an outside um, discipline. Um, the next thing I'd like to talk about in relation to the application process is the importance of reference letters. And so as part of both the applied MA and the PhD application, we do require a letter of references. One of the most common questions we receive is who should write those references for applicants. Um, my best advice to you as the grad director is find the people that can speak best to your professional preparation and your likelihood for success in a graduate program. For some of you, that very well may mean professors or advisors that you had in your current um, or previous colleges and universities and uh, as undergraduates or as master students if you're applying to our, our PhD program. Um, but for some of you, maybe you've been out of school a little bit longer and you don't have those um, fresher connections to academic professors or advisors at a university or college. It's absolutely okay to have a reference from a work environment, um, your current supervisor in a job or a previous internship or, or agency or nonprofit you may have worked for as well. What we ask is we ask our applicants to to again find professional references that can best speak to the applicant's strengths and how those strengths might play out in um, success in a graduate program here at UCF Sociology as well. Um, so that I think is a key element that sometimes um, our applicants ask a lot of questions about um, as well. Um, the final thing that I would say in relation to your application is in your personal statements, not only talking about your connections, um, your interest in sociology, why UCF sociology. Um, it's often helpful for student applicants to identify uh, potential faculty that they have maybe looked into and said, oh, you know, these three or four faculty seem like they're in my general area of interest that I'm thinking about. You know, naming those folks in your applications is always a potentially good thing. So we can see again if there's a fit in our program. We also do encourage our applicants, um, they're absolutely welcome to reach out to individual faculty um, to have conversations um, and just ask them if they're accepting students, if they're working with students, things like that. You're also more than welcome to follow up with myself as the graduate director and also Bridget as the admissions coordinator to have a one-on-one -on -one short 10 to 15 minute conversation to answer your questions and talk more one-on-one um, -on -one as well. Um, the final thing I would say in relation to the personal statement is um, the importance of also identifying, particularly at the PhD level for applicants, to identify your future aspirations. That doesn't mean you have to say um, you know, a specific job and, and I want to work at this university or anything like that, but we really would like to get a sense of um, how this sociology advanced graduate degree will help you get to that next career step. So talking about you know, I'm thinking about the academic path and I'd like to be a professor, like talking about that, or I'd really like to work for a nonprofit agency or a government agency that helps victims, for example, right? Lots of different um, approaches to doing that, but giving us some sense of what you think your future plans might be. And again, we recognize those plans may change, but just seeing how this advanced degree might help you along that path is another thing I think our graduate committee values as well. Um, so those are just a few kind of tips and tricks. The next thing I'd like to say, if we could move past the application process, um, is as the grad director, I, I think of myself as the head cheerleader for this program. Um, and I have to say, I'm so excited to see so many of you here. We have 30 people in the room. That's a great turnout in the virtual world. We're so appreciative of you being here. And we know with everything going around in the world, from a pandemic to racial and social injustices around the country and across the globe, um, in many ways, people might think it's not the best time to be a sociologist. I think many of our faculty, myself included, think this is the absolute perfect time to be a sociologist, right? There's so many opportunities for growth and learning and, and creating change um, out there. And so um, we feel really confident that you will be joining a vibrant community of scholars, um, including faculty, staff, and students that are interested in um, applying what they do in the world to make some sort of positive difference and change as well. So um, I can't tell you enough about how excited we are that you are considering applying to our program. 
And now it is my great pleasure to introduce um, our faculty panelists. So for the next 30 minutes, what we will do is we will talk about the five thematic areas of research and education interest in our department. And I've invited four faculty to share their thoughts, some opening remarks about each of those areas. So each of those faculty will share a few minutes of remarks about those areas. And then at the end of that, time with those four faculty. We'll open it up for Q&A. So again, you're welcome to put questions into the chat. You're also welcome to raise your hand and we'll address those questions after each of those four faculty speak as well. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce the crew. Uh, we will start off with Dr. Libby Mustaine, who is a full professor of sociology in the department and also the department chair. And she'll be sharing a little bit more about one of our areas known as crime and deviance. So Dr. Mustaine, please welcome uh, to take it away. Hello, everyone. It's, it, as Dr. Hawthorne said, it is so fantastic to see so many of you here. I'm, I'm so excited about that. Um, so I am a faculty member in the crime deviance area, and, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about it after, after my brief comments or after everyone's brief comments. Um, but basically here at UCF, the crime deviance area includes several really awesome faculty who are doing incredibly interesting research and teach very engaging seminars. Um, crime and deviance is a, a topic that interests a lot of people. It's a topic that you hear about in the news all the time. It's a, it's a great topic to be looking at through a sociological lens. Um, specifically, we have faculty who are doing research on the opiate crisis, marijuana use, crime in the community, um, how personal or community resilience impacts victimization and neighborhood crime rates. Um, our crim deviance faculty are looking at um, sex offenders and sex offender policy, um, how a person's lifestyle impacts their risks for criminal victimization. Um, homelessness and crime, domestic violence. I'll let Dr. Karras talk about that more though in, in soon. Um, sexual violence, other forms of violence. Um, our faculty have also, also look at um, how our research informs policy and how it could inform policy, as well as how it could be used by criminal justice actors or other agencies in the community that assist crime victims, that uh, have programs that, um, that service uh, criminal offenders, people who are coming back to the community after some period of time institutionalization, um, those kinds of things. So we, we also uh, have several faculty who are uh, who are very linked into the community and, and have a lot of agencies that they have experience with and have done research with. So um, we've got a lot of different kinds of individuals here in the crime deviance area. We also overlap with uh, pretty much all of the other areas um, in the department. Um, and I'll certainly not belabor those points since we have people talking about those other areas, but Crime and crime could definitely be thought of as a public health problem. Um, domestic violence is a type of crime, as well as a whole lot of other issues. Um, crime is a very locational kind of event, so spatial uh, spatial studies can inform crime studies as well. Um, and it would be really hard pressed to talk about crime without mentioning social inequalities and how social inequalities impact the way the criminal justice system works, the legal system, as well as individuals' experiences as victims, offenders, and, and just people who are working in the system or who have other, who have other uh, situations that bring them in contact with the criminal justice system. Um, so I will leave it at that and, and pass it over to our next speaker. And as I said, I'm happy to answer more specific questions, but I hope that gives you a really good overview of this area and what you might think about uh, studying if you were interested in crime deviance. 
All right, thank you, Dr. Mustaine. And I do see a couple of uh, questions coming in. So we will get to those questions after the next three speakers go, I promise. And I'm writing down the order of people as they raise hands as well. So do sit tight. Um, next, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Allison Cares, who is an associate professor of sociology in our department and also a core member of the Violence Against Women cluster at UCF more broadly. And she will be speaking specifically to the domestic viol violence area of interest in our department. Dr. Cares, please take it away. Thank you, Dr. Hawthorne, and welcome to everybody for coming to learn about UCF sociology. It is as my predecessors have said here, really exciting to see so many faces um, here today online. So um, I am an associate professor of sociology here at UCF. Um, I am like my colleagues um, in the department who focus on domestic violence, a part of UCS Violence Against Women cluster, which I will talk about in a couple of minutes. And like many of my colleagues in the department, I'm also an affiliate of the Women and Gender Studies program here. So in the time that they gave me, not that I wouldn't like to take it all, but I will try to be good. I want to talk about what attracted me to UCF sociology, what I think about us should be attractive to students. Um, that includes what type of things we have particular subject matter strength in and what we research and teach about. And then really to emphasize again, how we intersect with the other strengths in the department. So one of the things that really attracted me to UCF sociology is that we have this core of folks that are knowledgeable about, teach about, and research on domestic violence as one of the main things that they focus on. Um, and that we also have people who've worked on domestic violence, even if that's not their core area of research. And that's fairly unusual. A lot of times you're the only one in your department doing this work. So it's really nice to have a whole group of folks that are also interested in this either as one of their main things or on the periphery. So Dr. Mustaine, Dr. Rechtenwald, and I have all done substantial work in the area of intimate partner violence. And then Dr. Warner, Dr. Donley, uh, Dr. Vergara, who you're going to hear from in a few minutes, and I am sure I am missing some others, have also done work on domestic violence as a part of sort of their research. What that means for students, and this is where I get to the part about what I think is a strength about us for you, is that there's not just one person to come and work with or one particular thing about domestic violence that we know about and that you can learn about. Um, it also means that you get to be with a lot of people who get it. Um, so just yesterday I was talking about our schedule in the spring and that I get to teach a sexual violence in society course on the graduate level. And one of my colleagues said, nice. And what was really nice for me is that we didn't have to have the kinds of conversations I usually have then where, of course, you're not saying that sexual violence is nice, right? You're saying that it is really nice to have the opportunity to delve really deeply into this topic with other people who are interested in it and to really help educate the next generation of scholars and of practitioners so that we have a shot at actually reducing interpersonal violence in the next generation. Um, so that not having to explain myself all the time is, is a really nice thing. And I think it's nice for our students too. Um, it also means that you are with folks who still do understand about the responsible ways to talk about these issues and to do research on these issues, right? Uh, the responsible and the ethical ways, which means Broadly, that we're empowering and supportive of research participants and students, but it also means that we know how to take steps to minimize the emotional toll it can take to do this kind of research research on the researchers. And this is also actually, I think, the case for all of the things that we do in sociology. A lot of these things are really impactful, right? And things that we're motivated to change, but that sometimes can weigh kind of heavy on us. Um, so being able to have those talks and to be able to have a supportive sort of research team is something that we can offer that not everywhere can that I think is great. Another strength for students is that we are networked nationally and internationally, and we're really happy to share those networks of both researchers and practitioners um, so that you can grow your own networks. So I want to talk a little bit about our particular strengths in terms of our research areas and what courses you might get to take. Um, we all have some knowledge that overlaps that we share, and then we all have things that we um, have particular in-depth expertise on. 
Um, some of the things that we're really strong on here is intimate partner homicide, um, strangulation as a part of intimate partner violence, and along with that lethality assessment, um, strangulation is one of the strongest predictors of more serious um, domestic violence and lethality risk. Um, domestic violence education and prevention programs, help seeking for domestic violence, and assessment of domestic violence agency services. So we're really good at those things, but we're also really good at supporting all kinds of student projects and interests in domestic violence. Um, and we love our students and their work. So I want to share some recent examples. Um, so right now we have a thesis going on that we have a student looking at perceptions Arab Americans have of comfort level in seeking services for domestic violence and barriers to seeking those services. We have another thesis with a student looking at how COVID shutdowns impacted moms and their experiences if they had experienced intimate partner violence in the past or at that time. Um, a thesis that we had earlier this year looked at state level poverty policies and how that's related to rates of intimate partner violence um, at the state level. And then we recently had a dissertation that looked at differences in domestic violence attitudes across post-Soviet nations and how that was related to aspects of their economy that was related to petroleum production. So really different projects. Um, we also really um, have a strength in looking at a lot of the types of interpersonal violence that overlap with domestic violence, particularly sexual assault and child maltreatment, which people often refer to as child abuse and neglect. So the courses that we have, uh, we have a seminar on domestic violence that's sort of an overview that um, covers theory, research, and social policy. We have a reactions to domestic violence course that looks more at social institutions, such as the healthcare system and the criminal justice system and how they respond to domestic violence. We have a sexual violence in society course that I get to teach in the spring. We have a child abuse in society course that's going on right now. We have a sociological perspectives on victims course. And then we also have uh, a special topics courses that run frequently that can be all kinds of things. Um, and then the other thing is we're really diverse in terms of our methodological approaches, right? We do community-based participatory action research. We have people that will train you to do focus groups and interviews, right? We have surveys that you we can do. I believe that there is actually a project right now that is also looking at, that's using GIS to look in an urban area about things about domestic violence. So regardless of how you want to investigate things, that's something that we're really happy to support. Um, and then briefly to come back to the Violence Against Women cluster that I mentioned at the beginning and that I know Dr. Hawthorne mentioned, uh, this is a faculty cluster at UCF that brings together folks who do research on gender-based violence across departments and across colleges. So that also gives the opportunity to our students to join on some of the projects. Um, there's a lot of projects that we have going on there. Two of the ones that currently involve um, sociology students one is a community-based research project that is working on prevention education efforts with two victim services agencies, one of which is a domestic violence agency. The other is a secondary data analysis with data out of Michigan that is looking at attitudes about sexual violence. Um, and we're specifically looking at the attitudes parents hold to see sort of if there's um, potential there to try and have them be right the preventionists with their kids to again, hopefully have there be less violence in the next generation. Um, and I would love to go on and on and on, but I also know I have colleagues that want to talk about the other great things we do in our department um, and that we'll have questions. So I'll look forward to talking to you more in a couple minutes. All righty. Thank you, Dr. Cares. Uh, next up, it's my pleasure to introduce our colleague, Dr. Ingrid Lee. Um, Dr. Lee is a Associate Professor of Geographic Information Systems in the department and also a member of the College of Sciences GIS cluster. And she is going to be speaking to you to our brand new fifth area of specialty in the department called spatial sociology. So Dr. Lee, please take it away. Thank you, Dr. Hawthorne. Hello, everyone. I'm in Ruli. Uh, very nice meeting you all today. Uh, I'm going to introduce this new area of concentration, spatial sociology. Uh, if you have not heard of GIS, let me briefly talk about GIS first. So GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. Uh, we can use GIS to create 
integrate, analyze, and map all types of data, both qualitative data and quantitative data, both spatial data and non-spatial data. Given all data, all social phenomena have lo lo locational component. Given the powerful techniques CI can offer, so this area is able to help us better understand the social phenomena and the social problems. GIS has been widely used in social sciences uh, in the past several decades. For example, crime mapping and analysis, as Dr. Martin and Dr. Karras mentioned, spatial temporal analysis and the prediction of COVID-19 and many other types of diseases. Assessing community social environmental disparity, understanding the human environmental interaction, and so on. And there is a fast growing job market and the economic sector in GS in the US and many other countries. Governments, industries, academic and nonprofit organizations all need GIS professionals. Okay. Uh, spatial sociology is an emerging subfield within sociology. And this area integrates GIS, spatial thinking, and the sociological theories and the knowledge to examine social, health, environmental, and other problems. And this area provides different angles and a new methodology for social scientists to explore so many different research topics. Uh, for example, a former graduate student intended to visualize uh, health disparities and understand what factors influence individuals' health behavior. And the following social capital theory and the social ecological framework, this student collected, collected national survey data as well as relevant environmental and policy data. And she used the GIS technology to integrate individual level social demographic data, social network indicators, and the community built environment indicators, then map the pattern and identify the significant factors. And another example uh, is about crime analysis. Okay. A recent uh, graduate student applied geospatial analysis to visualize the spatial temporal patterns of crime instances and to understand how social disorganization theory and the routine activity theory can explain the crime pattern. Okay. And we have more and more students who have integrated the GIS, spatial thinking, and the sociological theories in their thesis and the dissertations in the last few years. So generally, GIS is, a, is able to interact all of the other four areas of concentration in our department. Okay. And finally, let me briefly talk about the courses uh, we offer in this area. Uh, in this area, Dr. Hawthorne and I teach several GIS courses, including one core course and the five elective courses. The GIS courses introduce both qualitative GIS and the quantitative GIS. And we, we emphasize on GIS applications in public health, crime analysis, social environmental studies, as well as community-based studies. Okay. So besides these GIS courses, this area also offers several courses on urban study, poverty and cities, uh, as well as space and inequalities. So this is a very interdisciplinary research area. So if you, are, you have questions or you are interested in this uh, area, please feel free uh, to ask me a question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, our next faculty panelist, it is my pleasure to introduce, is Dr. Angela Vergara. Um, and Dr. Vergara has the um, task of introducing two separate areas in our department. Um, she graciously was able to fill in for a last minute cancellation. Um, so um, she'll be speaking directly to the social inequalities thematic area. And then next after that, the medical sociology area as well. So please, Dr. Vergara, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Hawthorne, and thank you everyone for being here. Welcome. We really appreciate for you, all of you showing interest in our sociology department and graduate program. So yes, yeah, so I am a lecturer at the department. I teach uh, all the major, and I 
can't introduce both because I teach both areas within social inequalities and medical sociology. So I'm going to introduce each program separately, but also a lot of things are going to kind of come together in terms of how is it that we take classes and the different projects that you're able to work with and the on and the different faculty that you're able to work with. But I also want to introduce to everyone that I am a very happy alumni from this very same program, the PhD program in sociology. And pretty much how I ended up being a faculty in both tracks, it's because I was able to put my expertise together and my knowledge and the knowledge base that I wanted to gain uh, with a PhD in sociology and put it together within social inequalities and um, medical sociology, because my background and my master's degree was in experimental psychology, and I'm a practitioner, I, you know, and a mental health counselor. So I was able to bring that expertise and add the social inequalities, health outcome, medical sociology side of it. So I also been through the program. So to begin with, let me talk about the diversity and social inequality uh, track that we have. And just pretty much looking at everything, understanding social inequalities related to anything, age, gender, race, ethnicity, social class and stratification, sexual orientation, religion, family, you name it. If it's a social variable, it's a social factor, we're going to be able to look into many different ways, how social inequalities are perpetuated, how they are created, how is it that even this interconnection connected variables could potentially fix or create more social problems. And what all of my colleagues I said before, that's also what attracted me to this department as a student very much at a time that I went to a graduate uh, virtual opening, but also attracted me to stay as faculty is the ability that we have a huge team of people that we could pull from, depending on our interests, especially the more we go into really in depth into our specialties and, and what our interests are, we have the ability to work with different from people in the department while still maintaining the social inequality, social justice perspective, and also apply perspective. So in social inequalities, a lot of the classes that you're going to be taking are you know, race and ethnicity, sex and gender, uh, sex and reproduction, social movements and revolutions, but also you're going to start finding minority aging and health and global inequality. So you're able to have a social inequalities tracks in which you're able to not only gain knowledge within sociology and how is it that we look, study, talk about, analyze, work through, et cetera, et cetera, of social inequalities with social inequalities, but you'll be able to hone in your interest depending on the variables that you're interested in. So that is the major umbrella social inequalities. We have people within our social inequalities. So I work, my work specifically concentrated in mental health outcomes and any type of social inequalities associated with minoritized populations, especially Hispanic, Latinx, Latin, Latina, Latin, Latino, Latina community. As a Latina myself, that's a population that I'm very interested in dear to my heart. So that's where my research lies. But we have faculty under the social inequalities umbrella, working on race theory, working on men and masculinities, reproductive justice, reproductive health, uh, race scholars, ethnicity scholars. So we have a good group of people within the social inequalities. And then we are able to kind of branch over into other interests. So like Dr. Kerr said, I have worked within the domestic violence, specifically when talking about interpersonal violence and Hispanic Latina women. So that specific reunion of social inequalities and the domestic violence, we're able to work that way. So that leads me to the medical sociology degree and the medical sociology track. And this is the same uh, view of social inequalities, but that's what we're specifically looking to the social determinants of health and illness, impact that delivery of health care and access to medical resources, how society views, treats, understands, and re responds to illness and disease. So it's about understanding health and illness from the sociological perspective, from the sociological view of how within the structure of medicine, there's so many other cogs in the wheel that have an effect on people, whether people get sick or not, or even whether people have access to treatment or not. So that's kind of the basic overview of medical sociology, the classes that you're going to be taking 
aching is social determinants of health, health on illness. But one of the things that I always love about teaching uh, the graduate summer seminars in health inequalities, because it's social inequalities driven, it's theoretical, but it's also applied in terms, uh, you're going to learn a, a lot of different methodologies that we use, because that's another beauty, I should say, parenthesis on this in our department, that every single one of us has many different specialties in so many different methods of looking at sociological issues and structure that you can learn a lot just depending. So yes, we have GIS, but we have very strong qualitative methodologies, very strong quantitative methodologies. We have mixed methods people, we have survey analysis people. So you will find a faculty member that's gonna be able to lead you and guide you and help you depending on your interest, also in methodologies, not only on what you're interested in studying. So, and also in health inequalities, uh, like I was saying, medical sociology, when I teach uh, the graduate seminars in health inequalities, I also find that graduate students are able to connect with people from other departments because since it's such a broad subject and so we have students that come, graduate students who are getting their master's in biomedical sciences, in nursing, in about to go to medical school, social work, psychology, anthropology, political science. So that also allows uh, for collaboration and learning new things. So when students come in to this class and they're learning about each other and the different tracks and specialties and then they get to hear the projects that other students are presenting and working on and applying this sociological perspective this medical sociological perspective you can't you kind of grow your knowledge because now you're not only seeing the medical institution from the inside i.e those people working and studying to become the future doctors the future practitioners and nurses and even public health experts and you know health policy experts but you also get to see those of us in sociology and bringing that social inequality um, and social perspective to the way we analyze these tracks. So in terms of both social inequalities and medical sociology, like I said, because of this beauty of how I was able as a student, then as a candidate, and then now very, very excited to be faculty to kind of give back and pay it forward and provide that open doors and knowledge to future students and our current students, is that you are able to work in different ways. So I want to mention some of the projects that I either been part of as committee or just sometimes as methodologies or just I have an idea and it's about Hispanic people so I just want to run it by you. So we we'll have a student who is she's finishing her master's she will be defending her master's thesis uh, this uh, fall pretty soon a couple of weeks and she's doing specific work as a Cuban American specific work on the Cuban American social movements that happened summer of 2021. So that was really interesting looking at it to the kind of like minoritized Latino perspective because historically speaking Cubans do not protest. They are historically conservative, they vote Republican, they don't really participate in the narrative associated with social issues like immigration reform for example but something happened in summer 2021 that change that. So that was very interesting knowledge base that we're able to bring other scholars in her committee who are race specialists, who are ethnicity specialists and theories, qualitative methodologies, and then this Latino perspective to look at social movements. There's other students who are doing uh, research in access to endometriosis treatment, diagnosis and conversations around endometriosis, and looking into differences in race and ethnicity and gender identity, because that's also a big part of whether you are going to experience access of barriers. There's also students who are doing work on dental health. This is a future dentist who is part both of um, biomedical sciences and sociology. And they want to look into dental health and how to minimize, mitigate, and moderate for any type of racial and ethnic barriers that might be encountered that the Rosa practitioners. We have people working on food insecurity and homelessness, uh, not only with Central Florida. So also, mo all of us are, but I know within social inequalities, we are very well connected with the community and we also offer internships and possibility of internships or apply work that directly with other community uh, members. So we have students who work at Honor Palmer Hospital, who work at nonprofit organization, who works at Voto Latino here in Central Florida. So depending on also that interest of community activism, and public sociology and social activism, that's also it could be included and there's ways to include it depending on your interests. Um, so that's a lot. I know that's a lot of information about two major tracks. 
Uh, but like I said, it, this is that uh, the classes that you're taking, we do have our core classes associated, you know, medical sociology, social determinants of health. But then as you go into and you start honing into your own personal interests, especially as you move towards master thesis or dissertation, PhD dissertation, there's opportunity. So if you are interested in health outcomes, interpersonal violence, Latina immigrant women and health outcomes, you have a faculty for that pretty much. We have someone in the department who's doing the work in this very specific pockets and we do talk to each other and come together and work together. So like all my colleagues says too, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. You could always email us um, for further questions or more clarification or any type of ideas. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vergara. Um, we have time for one question before we move on to the student portion of the panel. Um, Dennis Fitzsimmons, your hand has been up for a while now. You've been waiting patiently. I don't know if you're still there. If you are, you're welcome to unmute and ask your question. Hi, I'm Dennis. Uh, can, any, can everyone hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay, I just, first of all, I want to say hello to Dr. Lee and Dr. Vargas. Uh, Vergara, I'm sorry. Um, um, both are uh, fellow teachers of mine this semester. Um, GIS is amazing, and Dr. Vergara's class is amazing also. Uh, and everyone has made amazing points about all of this, which is why I decided that rather than just going for a straight sociology, I thought that social sciences would be better. Now, I when I read the email today, there was a talk about how you can go from your um, BA to your PhD. And I know that I came in late. I apologize for that. I was making good art for my son, which isn't an excuse. I just, that's what I was doing. Um, and I don't know if you've talked about that previously, but can someone please explain that to me? because I'd like to know how that works and what kind of GPA I need to have and what, what the prerequisites are to be able to do that. Yeah, certainly. I, does. It, this, is, this is a field that I am, I would love to take Dr. Lee's GIS teachings and the others that are coming after and put them with every single other professor's and and start creating real things. I've been a visual effects artist for over 20 years. Sure. So I really want to start using like almost Hollywood level visual effects to get down to street level of GIS mapping when you're dealing with things like domestic violence, you know, let's get the body cam footage if you can, you know, to see how that call happened and whatever. I mean, you know, you get so downright specific, but you're still talking about a group mentality. And I just, I find it so interesting. And it really was Dr. Lee's class that kind of awakened me. I kind of was more of a sociology, psychology kind of a person, but um, I had already taken a mass media and social um, culture. So that's why I already had one under my belt on uh, political science is about halfway done for me as well. I'm also a history major or uh, history bachelors. So I guess my main question, sorry to ramble, is just how exactly would I go about going from, do I, can I go from social sciences to the yeah. PhD or do I need to do sociology to the PhD and then how do I do it? Yeah, thanks, Dennis. Really quick, um, I'll give you a short answer, and then I'd encourage you, me and Bridget, an email, and we're happy to set up a, a, a separate call also to talk more. But the short answer is absolutely yes, social science background, um, social science degree um, in your BA would certainly translate to success in our PhD program. Um, so definitely um, in your personal statement and your application, um, be able to speak to how that training kind of prepared you or got you interested in the sociology PhD program. So, you know, taking all the great things you shared about your background and your interest 
and kind of putting those into the written word in your personal statement would be a great way to kind of demonstrate um, that knowledge and interest in our program. Um, and again, I'm, I'm sorry, that's a really short, quick answer, but we're happy to um, have a follow-up email conversation or Zoom call with you as well, if you want to email myself and, and Bridget Firk. And I'll put my email in the chat here in a moment as well. That would be great. And I understand the short answer. I realized sure. I babbled a lot, so I apologize. Oh, no worries. Thank you, Dennis. So. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yep. Uh, All right. Well, have um, a good night, because that was you, really my only thing while I was on for. So you too. Uh, everyone be safe. All right. Okay. Um, the next uh, portion here in the last uh, few minutes of our conversation today um, will include the perspective of two of our PhD candidates to tell you a little bit from the student perspective what our program is all about and how our students are supported and also how they go on and, and have success. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our two um, student panelists. Both are PhD candidates in our department, late stage in the program. Um, we have B. Ben Kaluk and Madeline Diaz that will share a little bit more about um, their experiences in the department. So B and Madeline, please take it away. Uh, I can go first. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Madeline. I am a current doctoral candidate um, and on the job market. So I've been in the department for quite a while, um, got my bachelor's here as well. So just a forever night all the way. Um, but I do remember attending this type of information session um, when I was an undergrad. And this was really the catalyst to what made me apply to grad school because I learned learned more about the program and that I could engage in research on topics that I was really, really passionate about, which happened to be topics on crime and deviance. So I've done some research on human trafficking. Uh, my dissertation research is on sexual violence, particularly in the sexual minority community. Um, but I truly would not be where I am today without the support of faculty um, in this department. Um, I see one of my dissertation uh, members, Dr. Allison Kerr, um, <laughs> who is currently also my advisor um, for my research position. Um, but really all that to say is that you can find so much success in this department. Um, I think when you are a graduate student, whether that be a master's um, or now the PhD level, um, there are people in this department that wanna see you succeed and really wanna help you grow as a scholar. Um, but that also means that you have to put in the work as well um, to develop who you want to be as a scholar too. Because undergrad and graduate school is a little bit different in the fact that when you're an undergrad, you're kind of you know, going through the motions of trying to get your degree. And as a grad student, you're doing that as well, but really you're becoming an independent scholar. And so faculty members are here in the department to help you do that. Um, and so feel free to ask questions. Um, I won't take up too much time and I'll let uh, B introduce herself as well. Thanks, Maddie. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is B, um, and I am now a fourth year doctoral student. So I'm working on my dissertation. So. Um, a year kind of um, behind in terms of cohorts from, from Madeline. I am actually a very interdisciplinary scholar. So I have a bachelor's in psychology and a second bachelor's in child development. And then I got also got a minor in uh, human sexuality because why not? I was already doing it. Then I went off and got a master's in uh, psychology, but specifically in statistics and research methodology. And then I did a lot of non-degree seeking coursework in our education department here at UCF. And that helped me get additional credentials, which are graduate certificates. So having a graduate certificate in advanced statistical methods. And I am now studying uh, medical sociology. That's kind of like my area of research. And what that means is I study medicine and disease and health and illness and the structure of our medical system through a sociological lens. So although I do do work about health inequalities and um, health outcomes, I think my general approach is to look at that from a sociologist, right? So a um, little bit different than the way that medical research is and talked about. Um, and then, um, in terms of what Maddie already shared, I also do think that um, that's the biggest difference you'll see coming in from an undergraduate 
um, or master's level of degree, sometimes depending where you're at, is that you are beginning to form your identity as a as a professional. And so um, keeping that in mind that you select programs and apply to programs is to kind of consider how you identify and where do you want to be um, in terms of a professional level. Yeah, so I can answer any questions as well that you have for us. All right, thank you, Madeline and B. Are there any questions for Madeline or B and B? Uh, yes, yeah, Sarah Mitchum, please unmute. You're welcome to ask your question. Hi, uh, can you guys hear me okay? Sorry, I have a little bit of a frog in my throat. <clears> throat> we can hear you, go ahead. Um, I just graduated in the spring and with my undergraduate, and I was just asking what your guys' journeys as far as academic goes, whether you got your master's first or went straight into PhD. I know with the new PhD program, the master's isn't necessarily required, uh, but I was kind of interested in seeing and just hearing kind of your experiences about whether you think the master's best prepared you for the PhD or, you know, just kind of what your thoughts are on that. So I did get a master's um, before the PhD. I actually got my master's here at UCF. Um, so again, go nights forever and ever. Uh, but I really do think that it helped me at least become more familiar with larger reading assignments um, and also getting more familiar with how scholarly articles are not only um, written, but how could I produce work that could eventually be published in some sort of um, peer reviewed journal. And so just speaking from my experience, I thought that was a really helpful uh, experience for me to be a little bit better prepared for the PhD program. Um, but I can't speak too much to what our new program may look like. Um, it could be that, you know, the BA to the PhD that UCF will um, eventually have will also kind of very slowly prepare you um, and build you up. And so they won't kind of start off with PhD level stats and theory, you know, day one, um, I'm sure will be kind of a, a slow trajectory towards that. But I definitely think that school's always going to be there. I was the kind of person that I went through everything. Like I got my bachelor's, my master's, and now my PhD soon. Um, but sometimes I do look back and, and think that, you know, there was never a rush really. And so if you or any of you in this uh, Zoom call right now, if you feel unsure about your direction, it's okay to take a, a break in between degrees. There's no rush at all. School will always be there. Um, and sometimes I've found that there are people who do take that route of having some sort of career after their bachelor's and they come back to the PhD program, they're much more um, aware of what they want to do and where they want to go. And so it, they can be a little bit more focused. Um, I don't regret my track, uh, but I do think about kind of the differences uh, that it could have been, but it did work out for me, thankfully. Yeah, so I'm the other student. I'm the student that took time off between um, I didn't take time off between my bachelor's and my master's, um, but I did take time off going from my master's to my PhD. I took five years off and I felt that I needed them. But when I came back, I came back knowing kind of exactly where I wanted to go. So those five years that I took <laughs> off, people always think that I was really taking time off. I really wasn't. I was really trying to figure out where I was in terms of where I wanted to go. And so um, I'm a big advocate also for time off. Like Maddie said, I, I don't regret my journey. I think what you do with that time off is more important than how much time off you take. And so for me, um, although I didn't do like the master's to PhD, I never forgot what I learned in my master's because I was able to apply it on the job market uh, while I was working. So I was doing statistics and I was doing research and um, I all those things that I would have otherwise continued to learn, I did in the applied setting. Thank you both so much. I appreciate it. Okay, I see that um, Alicia has her hand up, but I did want to um, talk a little bit more about 
how the um, BA to PhD works in regards to a master's program. Um, what will happen uh, when students come into the revised BA to PhD program, your first two years of coursework is actually going to be essentially at the master's level. Um, so as you're working through, um, as uh, Madeline mentioned, we're not throwing you into PhD levels, you know, stats and theory right away. You're going to be working on a master's level and elective courses, as well as courses um, to teach you more about uh, academic reading and writing, as well as preparing for um, your research report, which comes in the, the last semester after the, you know, that two years of course study. Once you complete that research report, um, you will earn uh, what we call a master's along the way. So you'll be granted a master's degree at that juncture. Um, so uh, at that point, um, beyond that, you're going to be in those PhD level classes, the more advanced classes, um, as well as as you know, working toward um, your dissertation requirements and things of that nature. So um, for the students who um, are worried about not having you know, that master's level or the graduate level coursework, um, that shouldn't be as much of a concern because you're going to be starting at that master's level. Uh, Dr. Hawthorne, is there anything else you wanted to add to that? No, I think you covered it really well, but I did want to address, I saw a couple questions in there related to funding and tuition and scholarships. Um, so we're happy to send out more information about this to everybody on the list, but just really quickly before we um, end the call in a couple seconds, um, for, for those, those applying, applying to the BA to PhD program, there are tuition, full tuition waivers and what's called a GTA, a graduate teaching assistantship opportunity available. That would include a tuition waiver to cover your tuition and also a stipend for the fall and spring semesters totaling $19,000. And then also in the summer semester, we have a separate pool of money typically um, where we also are able to often provide support for a high percentage of students that apply for that at the PhD level. Um, in our new BA to PhD program redesign, we will not be offering funding for the standalone applied MA program. Um, but again, as, as Bridget mentioned a moment ago, if you're thinking about um, a, a master's and a PhD, um, you know, a master's along the way kind of route. Um, certainly, if you apply to that PhD program, PhD program, there would be um, potential funding opportunities available. And again, we'll send out more information about this to everybody as well. Um, I am mindful of the time here. I know we're right at 430. So I want to be mindful of that time. And I just want to thank um, our panelists for joining us. And more importantly, and most importantly, I want to thank all of our potential applicants um, for joining us today. We appreciate your time, your interest in our program. And whether you end up choosing to apply to us or not, I, I think at the end of the day, what we hope for is that you end up in a graduate program that can best support your personal growth. We hope that's us. But most importantly, we hope you find a program that is best fit for you and everything you hope to bring to the discipline of sociology and related fields. So we thank you again. We will email out the recording and some follow-up information, and we hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon and evening. So thank you very much.